So these are relatively short chapters, these two, um, especially chapter seven. It's pretty much just one scene. Um, so <laughs> most of the chapter is up here in the presentation as a result of it being very short. Um, okay, just a sec. Uh -huh. So um, yeah, we start off with uh, Billy getting into a plane to go uh, to an optometry convention with a bunch of his colleagues, <clears throat> 28 other optometrists, including his father-in-law, Lionel Merble. Uh, he knows the plane is going to crash. Uh, he doesn't want to make a fool of himself by saying so. <clears throat> the more I think about Billy's character um, in these descriptions, the more I think about Merceau from The Stranger. <laughs> um, he's almost like a victim of his own experience. <clears throat> Just along for the ride. Like there's a little homunculus, a little man inside of him. <laughs> just riding along and watching the world go by. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, they get onto the plane. His wife's outside. Uh, his father-in-law is right next to him. We get the detail that comes up in other areas of the book that Lionel is a machine. Uh, Trophimadorian say, Every creature and plant is a machine. It amuses them that many earthlings are offended by the idea of being machines. Um, as they have, I don't even know if you could call it a deterministic view of the universe. I guess so, but what does determine even mean if there's no such thing as time? Um, I guess that's the best way we could understand it as deterministic. Outside the plane, the machine named Valencia, a marble pilgrim, was eating a Peter Paul Mounds bar. I don't know what to make of that. Uh, there are three scenes now in which she's described as eating a candy bar, and we get it uh, that you know she likes to eat. It's. I, I always wonder why he puts the names of the candy bars. These are actual, actual candy bars. There was a Snickers in in one, and then a. Uh, Three Musketeers, I think, in the other, and then this one is the Peter Paul Mound. <clears throat> huh. I just remembered, actually, that the whole campaign for uh, Mounds Bars uh, and Almond Joy. Okay, so there are two. <laughs> Quick side note there are two candy bars made by the same company. I'm not a huge candy fan, I just remember this from childhood. There's Almond Joy and there's Peter Paul Mound. They're both made by the same people. And they had a song because one of the candy bars has almonds in it. And this one, Mounds, does not have almonds in it. And so the song was, sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. <laughs> She's eating the Mounds bar, so she does not feel like a nut. A nut is also <laughs> a crazy person. <laughs> okay. Never mind. I don't think that, that he meant anything like that. It's just maybe an interesting side note. You could probably find those commercials on YouTube if you're interested in listening to commercial jingles from the 1980s uh, and maybe 90s. The plane crashes, as we knew was going to happen. I mean, we've already heard that it's going to happen. Billy had a fractured skull. Uh, I, I skipped the scene, but on the plane, the, the barbershop quartet was there and they were singing foul, like dirty songs for everyone to laugh at. Um, I didn't feel like we needed to analyze the dirty songs <laughs> unless you'd like to say something about it. Um, the plane crashes. Uh, okay, it seems like they were just there to let us know that it was, you know, guys goofing off. And that was the whole reason to have those there. Um, 
Although, okay, we'll get to that later. <laughs> there is the thing about him accidentally witnessing the execution of a Polish man. So maybe there is something more there. Yeah, we'll look into it later, perhaps. Billy had a fractured skull, but he was still conscious. He didn't know where he was. So this is after the plane has crashed, of course. His lips were working. One of the gollywogs put his ear close to them to hear what might be his dying words. Do you guys know what a gollywog is? That's kind of a British term. Uh, anyone? It's a... It's considered offensive these days, but it's like a, a little doll of a black man. And they're kind of racist caricatures. They're not considered uh, very politically correct, let's say, these days. Um, he says that they look like gollywogs because they had ma like ski masks on. So that's why he calls them gollywogs. Uh, Billy thought the gollywog had something to do with World War II, and he whispered to him his address. Schlachtofunf. Okay, guys, why is he saying that? <laughs> I mean, we know what it means. We know it means Slaughterhouse-Five. Anybody want to say something about why he says Slaughterhouse-Five? I mean, it's kind of just a little story detail. Anyone remember? Well, because he was instructed by the, the German guards to memorize that address. And I mean, you've got to look at it from, from poor Billy's perspective. He's constantly being jettisoned into the future and the past. And he doesn't necessarily know in this moment where he is. So he just uses his memorized address because he thinks he's back in World War II for the moment. I mean, I pretty much says it right there, but. Um, <clears throat> so he gets taken down the mountain on a toboggan. Uh, the toboggans are controlled with ropes. The gollywogs are melodiously yodeling for right of way. Near the bottom, the trail swooped around the pylons of a chairlift. Okay, Billy looked up at all the young people in bright elastic clothing and enormous boots and goggles, bombed out of their skulls with snow, uh, swinging through the sky in yellow chairs. He supposed they were an amazing new phase of World War II. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Uh, why, is, why is everyone dressed so colorfully now? Oh, it must be the amazing new phase of World War II. The, uh, the disco phase <laughs> of World War II that we're all familiar with. It was all right with him. Everything was pretty much all right with Billy. Again, that's so <laughs> Merceau from The Stranger. Uh, everything's pretty much all right with him. He doesn't really have an opinion on his own existence. He was taken to a small private hospital. A famous brain surgeon came up from Boston and operated on him for three hours. <clears throat> Billy was unconscious for two days after that. He dreamed millions of things, some of them true. The true things were time travel. So if we wanted to take the view that the time travel was uh, not real, um, we've got other, we've got, you know, the electric shock therapy, and we also have brain trauma and brain surgery. Um, that would support the thesis that it's, you know, completely imaginary uh, combination of physical and emotional traumas that have driven him to that experience. Uh, it's funny though that he says the true things were the time travel. <laughs> Werner Gluck, the young guard, was a Dresden boy. This is an interesting detail. <clears throat> he had been uh, in Slaughterhouse before, so he wasn't sure where the kitchen was. Oh, sorry, he had never been. Uh, he was tall and weak like Billy, might have been a younger brother of his. They were, in fact, distant cousins. Okay, so uh, why is this in here? <laughs> what is this detail? This detail is worth asking about. Uh, what is the relevance to the story of the detail 
that Werner Gluck is actually a distant cousin of Billy's. Anyone? So think about it. Uh, it's kind of entirely a sort of historical accident that they are on the sides that they're on to some extent. Um, if you recall the introduction to the book, uh, we find out that Kurt Vonnegut himself is of German descent, he tells us at the very beginning. Um, think about it from his perspective, uh, kind of realizing, I mean, the real Kurt Vonnegut uh, as a prisoner of war in Slaughterhouse Five realizing that you know he is uh also of german descent and the universe just kind of arranged things in such a way <laughs> that he's a prisoner of uh german soldiers not even real soldiers as it turns out um so there, there's more of that arbitrariness once again things could have been much different in the same way that fate dressed Billy Pilgrim like a fool or like some sort of crazy wizard. Uh, it happens that he is guarded by a distant cousin and they are completely unaware of this fact. Uh, Gluck was armed with a musket. Um, from the description, you might guess what a musket is. Single shot museum piece with an octagonal barrel and a smooth bore. So this is a very, very old gun that probably takes about five minutes to load a shot into. Um, so again, he's like, you know, not properly, this guy's not properly armed or equipped either. He had fixed his bayonet. It was like a long knitting needle. Uh, it had no blood gutters. <laughs> if we recall, Roland Weary's knife had blood gutters that would make people continue to bleed, and he was very proud of the fact. Um, but Werner Gluck is very much like Billy. He's, he doesn't want to be here. <laughs> he doesn't want to be in the situation. Um, when the three fools found the communal kitchen, by the way, there's a scene where they walk in on all the, the girls showering and we kind of get a glimpse of the innocence of both Billy and Werner. They both, you know, respectfully <laughs> look away <laughs> and they, we find out that they had never seen a naked woman before. Um, and Edgar uh, what does Edgar do? I can't even remember now. He doesn't do anything. No, nobody does anything. Uh, when they finally find the kitchen, uh, whose main job it was to make lunch for the workers, everybody had gone home, but one woman who had been waiting for them impatiently, she was a war widow. So it goes. <laughs> she had her hat and coat on. She wanted to go home too, even though there wasn't anybody there. Her white gloves were laid out side by side on the zinc countertop. She had two big cans of soup for the Americans. It was simmering over low fires on the gas range. She had stacks of uh, loaves of black bread too. Okay, this is just keeping the story up. Um, she asked Gluck if he wasn't awfully young to be in the army. He admitted he was. She asked Edgar if he wasn't awfully old to be in the army. He said he was. Uh, she asked Billy Pilgrim what he was supposed to be. <laughs> so remember how he's dressed. Uh, she just looks at her and says, what are you supposed to be? Um, he said he didn't know. He was just trying to keep warm. All the real soldiers are dead, she said. It was true. So it goes. Uh, so yeah, that's the whole reason of putting this little exchange here is uh, to get to that point that this is, as we said before, towards the end of the war, <clears throat> all the real soldiers are gone at this point. Uh, all that are left are such as Edgar and Billy and Gluck. On his second day, Billy was cleaning behind a radiator and he found a spoon. 
So there's the syrup. They're working at a syrup factory, and the syrup is some kind of uh, nutritive syrup. Uh, apparently some kind of prenatal supplement. Uh, and the soldiers, the prisoners, have taken to you know, stealing little bits of syrup. <clears throat> Billy finds a spoon behind a radiator. To his back was a vat of syrup that was cooling. The only other person who could see Billy and his spoon was poor old Edgar Derby, who was washing a window outside. The spoon was a tablespoon. Billy thrust it in the vat, turned it around and around, making a gooey lollipop. He thrust it into his mouth. A moment went by, and every cell in Billy's body shook with ravenous gratitude and applause. Nicely put. <laughs> uh, imagining every cell applauding. It's, uh, it's good. There were different wraps. Uh, diffident, sorry. Diffident means uh, sort of... Uh, shy, hesitant, a little bit quiet. The opposite of diffident would be forthcoming, loud, brash, confident. Uh, diffident raps on the factory window. Raps are, by the way, <laughs> raps are just taps. So it's like gentle taps on the window. Derby was out there having seen all. He wanted some syrup too. So Billy made a lollipop for him. He opened the window, stuck the lollipop into the poor old Derby's gaping mouth. Notice how Derby is always called poor old Derby because we always know his fate. Uh, a moment has passed. Sorry, a moment passed and then Derby burst into tears. So, you know, he's in such a desperate state that the simple thing such as a bit of syrup wrapped around a spoon is enough to bring him to, to tears. Billy closed the window and hid the sticky spoon. Somebody was coming. Yes? Did you raise your hand, Evana? No. Oh, okay. Um, by the way, if we recall the writing of uh, Howard Campbell. Yeah, Howard Campbell. Couldn't remember his name for a second. This is pretty contrary to what Howard Campbell was saying. Howard Campbell, remember, is the Nazi American who's writing propaganda to try to recruit the uh, try to recruit American prisoners. And we're about to see him again, but earlier they were reading bits of writing of his, and he said that you could expect no solidarity among the soldiers, uh, among the American prisoners, because they had been programmed to you know, struggle against each other. But that's not the case here. There is some solidarity. Billy takes at least a small risk for Derby. Right. I mean, uh, it does mention that uh, even though lots of prisoners were doing it, it was certainly a punishable offense to steal syrup. In any case, who should arrive but Howard Campbell himself? <laughs> the description of Howard Campbell's costume cannot be understated. And we're going to talk about that because it's hilarious by itself. <clears throat> the choice of words here. Okay, I know that nobody answered me before, but did, did you guys read this? <laughs> because it's, it's really something. Um, <laughs> the way he's described, the way his costume is described. Of course, he's wearing a cowboy hat. Um, his, I put this up here because he sounds to me like a combination of a Nazi and Evil Knievel. If you don't know who Evil Knievel was, yes, that's a German name. His name is Evel Knievel. He was a real guy. He was famous for uh, motorcycle stunts in the 1970s and 1980s. And I think he did something in the 90s. He died in 2006 or seven, uh, something like that. His name was Evel Knievel. Okay. Um, and the description of this outfit just sounds, it just reminded me of him. That's why I put these pictures up here <laughs> because he's there to recruit the Americans. Um, I've got the description. He was an ordinary looking man, but he was extravagantly costumed in a uniform of his own design. So this is uh, not somebody else's idea. He wore a 10 gallon white cowboy hat 
a white 10 gallon hat. So a 10 gallon hat would be a cowboy hat. It's one of those big ones. Um, black cowboy boots decorated with swastikas and stars. <laughs> now this part kills me. He was sheathed in a blue body stocking. That's what I mean by the choice of words. This is not uh, a suit. <laughs> it's not a, a uniform. It's not like a two piece suit. It's a body stocking. <laughs> so he's just... <laughs> It's like a superheroes, like like an old superheroes kind of thing. Hey, there's Yelena. Hi, Yelena. Are you with us? Yeah. Yes. Oh, great. Good of you to show up. I was wondering if you were going to join us. Yes, I had problems last time. Well, I'm glad you finally made it. We were just discussing the hilarious uniform of Howard Campbell in the book. And I have to back up to show you on this. Like, I <laughs> Do you remember in the story when Howard Campbell, the American Nazi, shows up at the camp to recruit people? And uh, I just had to put these pictures up because Evil Knievel, this guy on the right, was an actual uh, entertainer in the US. Yes, his name was Evil Knievel because it was some weird German name. He jumped, he was a motorcycle stunt guy. He would jump over cars with a motorcycle and he became famous for that. He also became famous for crashing and <laughs> burning a number of times. Um, but this uniform <laughs> as described, a 10 gallon hat with black cowboy boots decorated with swastikas and stars. He was sheathed in a blue body stocking. Okay, so like, like Batman in the 1960s <laughs> or 1950s, the, the old kind of like tights which had yellow stripes running from his armpits to his ankles. <laughs> I really, I, I was searching for somebody's artistic rendition of this. I think I'm gonna have to draw one myself because nobody has bothered making this, this drawing or I found a picture from the, uh, the 1978, I think 1978 movie and it didn't do justice. It didn't have a body stocking. <laughs> Uh, his shoulder patch was a silhouette of Abraham Lincoln's profile on a field of pale green. He wore, uh, he had a broad armband, which was red with a blue swastika in a circle of white. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. I mean, or I'm done laughing at the body stocking part. That's pretty hilarious though, because he's just got to look like a ridiculous, a ridiculous superhero. Like the ridiculous villain, I should say, from a, a ridiculous superhero movie. Um, something yeah uh, what uh, does mean swastika what, uh... swastika isn't that the same i thought it was the same in serbian swastika is the nazi symbol that yeah 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 <laughs> that's just to see how what see how wild this costume is it's got lincoln <laughs> it's got a swastika uh it's it's really something uh something it's the same in serbia he said in serbia swastika is uh... Ah, okay. The same. Talking. Yeah, yeah. Swastika. I thought it was the same. Actually, uh, in Serbian is nevesta, but it means the same. <laughs> nevesta. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh. Like bride. No, it's. Uh... No, swastika is uh, the sister of. Uh, if you are a man, swastika is sister of your. Uh... Oh, you're saying in Serbian. <laughs> no, no, a swastika is a symbol. Okay, I'll try to draw it. No, 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 you know what is uh, the, it's a symbol of the- uh, Of the Nazi German. party. Yeah, the Nazi party. Yes. And uh, the... before that, uh, they're using in India, like yes. a symbol of sun, actually. We know yeah. what was the meaning uh, uh, in, the, in World War II, actually. Yeah, but we yeah. different. We, we translate swastika differently, but it's the same meaning, like in uh, states. Yes. Yeah. No, I know it, it's an it's an ancient symbol, uh, and it was appropriated <laughs> by the Nazis. Um, okay. So yeah, uh, he's got. So I want to talk about this costume for a second, aside from laughing at it because it's just amazingly funny. Um, <clears throat> how about the irony? Okay. I'm not going to say it. Can anybody spot the extreme irony here? <clears throat> it's completely funny. It is completely funny, but the irony of Lincoln <laughs> being on there. Yes. Uh, 
because of course, you know, Lincoln was someone at least who, you know, had egalitarian impulses, <laughs> uh, which it's just wildly funny. Like, you know, he said he's a Nazi with, and then here's something else. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to take you down a very short rabbit hole um, because, okay, there are certain people in the US, in the South, who are what we call Southern revisionists. They're generally like white nationalists. They're kind of racist people who believe the South will rise again and so on and so forth. They consider Lincoln to be a tyrant, which is wild because <laughs> those people would definitely have uh, antipathy towards Lincoln and they would be much more like Howard Campbell. <laughs> so it's extremely ironic. Like uh, what, if you were ever to have the displeasure of meeting one of these people, <laughs> you, would, uh, you would notice that they also share a lot of other kinds of racist and conspiratorial ideas <laughs> about the world in general, including about the Jews. Um, in fact, most of them are convinced that Abraham Lincoln was Jewish and blah, 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 blah. You know, all the conspiracy stuff. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's really funny that he's got a Lincoln <laughs> silhouette on his uniform on a field of pale green. Uh, I, I thought about that at first as a literal picture of a field, but I think it's just a pale green background. That That's what they mean here. <clears throat> so hilarious outfit. Um, I don't know how anybody could take him seriously, but then if you think about Billy Pilgrim's outfit, <laughs> what a motley crew of people. <laughs> Just <laughs> imagine looking into that room and seeing, seeing all of them. I mean, many of them are clearly prisoners of war, but then you've got Billy Pilgrim who's dressed up like some crazy wizard uh, and Howard Campbell who's dressed up like some crazy supervillain. <laughs> whose outfit doesn't even make sense. <laughs> okay. Uh, he's explaining his outfit to the American prisoners. Blue is for the American sky. White is for the race that pioneered the continent, drained the swamps, cleared the forests, and built the roads and bridges. Okay, so this is straight up racist stuff. Uh, red is for the blood of American patriots, which was shed, shed so gladly in years gone by. That's his explanation. Now, I have to say really quick, slightly spoiling another book, uh, the book Mother Night, which is another Kurt Vonnegut book. And in that book, Howard Campbell is the main character. And the reason I want to mention it here is because he in that book is, um, the whole plot of that book is that he is pretending to be a Nazi. He's recruited by an intelligence officer. I've mentioned this before because we talked about the Blue Fairy. In Mother Night, the intelligence officer is called the Blue Fairy. That's his code name, who says, we want you to pretend to be a Nazi because Howard Campbell grew up in Germany. He was famous there as a writer. Uh, he had written plays. He had married a famous uh, opera singer, I think, in, in the story. And uh, he has a radio show that's Nazi propaganda in English uh, broadcast for American and other Anglophile, ang Anglophone, I mean, uh, audiences. Uh, he has his radio show scripted for him and he's instructed to <clears throat> cough and make noises at certain places. And he's actually secretly communicating war intelligence by doing that. Anyway, not to get into too much detail, but my point about this is that he's pretending to be a Nazi, right? Now, <laughs> I don't know, I'm hard pressed in this scene. It doesn't seem like he's pretending or I don't know, it's really hard to say. <clears throat> I mean, you know, from Mother Night from, you know, from that book that he is pretending to be a Nazi. That's the whole point. But then again, the, the, 
the moral of the story for that book is you you kind of are what you pretend to be in, in very important ways you, that you can't really escape you know if you act like something for long enough that's that's what you are you know at some point that's what you are <laughs> if you if you act like a nazi for a certain amount of time then you're a nazi <laughs> there's not some you know mystical inner layer that's not a nazi anyway uh so yeah you know here he's pretending to be a Nazi and he's chosen a ridiculous outfit. Um, but he seems to be pretty convinced in this scene. That's the thing that get, that gets me, you know? Um, I don't know. I, I, I can't make a decision on this, but you guys see my problem, right? <laughs> he's, in, he's talking to prisoners of war inside of a camp. He's not on a radio show right now. I guess he wants to make sure the other guards inside of there are do you see what I mean? The big problem in Mother Night comes about when the war ends and he has to be like, hey, guys, I was just playing. And they're all like, what? <laughs> what do you mean you're just playing? <laughs> okay, not in those words, obviously. I'm, I'm making, making short and fun version of that. Um, anyway, yeah, like who's he performing for in that scene? That's my, my issue with it. Is he performing for the prisoners of war? Or is he performing for the other guards? I don't know. Maybe he really is always a Nazi, nothing else. Um, poor old Edgar Derby squares up to Campbell. Square up uh, as, a, as an idiomatic phrase or like a phrasal verb means that he steps up to fight, to take a fighting position. He steps up to Campbell. His stance was that of a punch drunk fighter. Punch drunk means you know, when, when the boxer has been punched a few oh. times and he's kind of waving, waving around a little bit. His head was down, his fists were out front waiting for information and a battle plan. His fists are waiting for orders. Derby raised his head, <clears throat> called Campbell a snake. He corrected that. He said snakes couldn't help being snakes and Campbell, who could help being what he was, was something much lower than a snake or a rat or even a blood-filled tick. Campbell smiled. Again, Campbell is supposed to be acting here. Uh, a tick is a blood drinking insect, not a mosquito, but the ones that live in trees. <laughs> it's not a leech either, the, not the water ones. <laughs> okay, it's said in the story uh, that at this point, Edgar Derby becomes a character. So This is uh, the reason it's not in italics is it's not quoted from the book. In the story at that point, we're told that Ed Edgar Derby becomes a character and that there are no characters in this book. So I, would, I just wanted to ask you guys, what do you think he means when he says that there are no characters in this book and that at this point, Edgar Derby becomes a character? Anybody have any guesses? There are no wrong answers here, guys. <laughs> you can say whatever you like. Uh, yeah, what? He had, he had to uh, defend his point of view, uh, how he see uh, this war. Good. That's good. Or how he sees Howard Campbell, at least. That's, that's what we get out of it. But yes, he does. He stands up. Okay. Now, why are, there, why is, why are we told there are no other characters in the book, though? That's what it says in the in the text. There are no other characters in this book where we find out. You're you're right what you said there, but think about that compared to everybody else. So that's the thing. If you'll notice, the book is full of people who are along for the ride, right? Billy's along for the ride. Billy's like a passenger in his own life. <laughs> right? He's just sitting on the train that is his life, looking at the world go by outside. That's why Billy is not a character because he never squares up against anything. Uh, Edgar Derby is the only one who ever stands up at any point uh, and resists. Now, I, I, I guess, you know, if you think about it, maybe Billy's daughter kind of resists when she gets mad at Billy when he's older, but that's, I don't know. 
she's not squaring off against him, squaring up against him. Um, so yeah, no, you're right though. Ed Edgar is a character because he stands up and resists and is alone in doing so. Uh, Derby goes on. He speaks movingly of the American form of government with freedom and justice and opportunities and fair play for all. He said there wasn't a man there who wouldn't gladly die for those ideals. He spoke of the brotherhood between the American and Russian people and how those two nations were going to crush the disease of Nazism, which wanted to infect the whole world. The air raid sirens of Dresden howled mournfully. <clears throat> now, a lot of people don't realize this, um, but at the end of World War II, uh, it was widely recognized, and there is a lot of evidence of this, including polls, enquete polls, uh, newspaper headlines, newspaper articles that showed that af right after the war, the Americans recognized and appreciated the sacrifice of the Russians, right? It's taken 60 years of, uh, well, obfuscation, propaganda, 60 years of propaganda to, to, change, to erase that memory. <laughs> it's an unfortunate fact. But yeah, there's, there is loads of evidence to show this, that uh, Americans recognized at that time what had happened. And uh, the Russians were spoken of glowingly at that point, but then, you know, things started happening <laughs> somewhere in some back rooms where minds were changed. Uh, the air raid sirens of Dresden howled mournfully. We finally meet Kilgore. Kilgore, by the way, is portrayed so <laughs> awfully. Uh, we'll talk about why that might be. We finally meet Kilgore himself. We've heard of him from his stories earlier uh, in the hospital. If you guys recall, where Billy is, you know, reading Kilgore Trout stories with Elliot Rosewater. Uh, Trout lives in a rented basement in Ilium, about two miles from Billy's nice white home. What a coincidence, Trout lives right near Billy. He himself has no idea how many novels he has written, <laughs> possibly 75 of the things. Not one of them has made money. So Trout keeps body and soul together as a circulation man for the Ilium Gazette. Uh, if you guys weren't clear about what this all means, he is a manager of newspaper delivery children. <laughs> uh, it was... I don't know if that job still exists. It was a kind of job that you could have, uh, I think probably before the 1990s or 2000s, if you were you know, a teen, preteen, and you wanted to make some extra money, you could have a bike paper route where you would bicycle around and throw the newspaper onto people's front porch or step or whatever, um, or put it in the, in the mailbox. You could also do that. Uh, the job was Paperboy. I, I don't know if that job still exists. Uh, it seems like nowadays, uh, I mean, circulation of physical copies of newspapers is way down at this point. I mean, that, that's just the nature of uh, how news is disseminated now, mostly digitally, you know. The, <laughs> like, bike down the street throwing uh, USB <laughs> storage devices onto people's front porch. <laughs> um, anyway, Trout is a manager of these children who deliver newspapers on their bikes. Uh, and the way he's described here, he manages newspaper delivery boys, bullies and flatters and cheats little kids. <laughs> so we don't get this very pleasant description of Kilgore Trout. Kilgore Trout, every time we meet him in, in Vonnegut novels, is kind of a, here's a good word to learn, he's kind of a curmudgeon. Oh, we have someone else. Hey, it's level you. Uh, yeah, are you with us? I think I am. Oh, great, cool. 
late much. <laughs> um, anyway, we're, uh, yeah, we're just meeting Kilgore Trout, finally, the actual man himself. And I was just saying, yeah, he's, anytime you meet him, he's, he's a curmudgeon. Uh, it's a good word to learn. Uh, Surmudgeon. <laughs> curmudgeon. I just tried to do the Serbian like pronunciation of the letters. Uh, a grumpy, uh, let's say, yeah, ill-tempered, relatively unpleasant, somewhat bitter, disaffected person. And yeah, he's described as a bully and flatterer and cheat of little kids, uh, which is kind of funny. I, I picked up this picture. Uh, this is from, um, I told you that there's a film production of Breakfast of Champions that's not not great. It's okay. It's, it's a hard book to do, I, I, I guess, in, in a film version. And it changes a lot of details. But I did like their Kilgore Trout. I can't remember this actor's name now. Uh, uh, I think it's a fair representation, except he's supposed to have a beard. That's my one complaint here. Um, uh, that's uh, that is the actor I saw the movie uh, in the title Breakfast of Champions. That's what I was just saying. Yes, this is a picture of him from from Breakfast of Champions. And I can't remember his name because uh, yeah, but can I. he was uh, uh, pretty famous at the time. Yeah, he was a British actor, I believe. British. Uh, I think so. Uh, I'll find it out later. Um, yeah, he did. A, I, I liked their the, the Kilgore Trout in that film. The film is okay. Like, you, if you don't know anything about the book, then it's kind of better. <laughs> you could just watch it as a movie by itself and say, okay. But I mean, it it pulls punches. If you guys know what I mean, like they make it a bit lighter than the book. I mean, right from the start, uh, Dwayne Hoover's wife is supposed to be dead. She's supposed to have killed herself, but not in the movie. Of course, she's alive. Anyway, stuff like that. It's always a little. It's a little bit Hollywooded, and it's you know, it's Bruce Willis plays the main character, which you might say that's very strange for such a very cult kind of title like Breakfast of Champions, but. Turns out a lot of people like Kurt Vonnegut <laughs> and are just happy to be in a Kurt Vonnegut anything. Um, I, you know, it's not a great movie, but I still, you know, if you want to watch it for science, you should. <laughs> for science, quote unquote. Uh, it's, uh, it's okay. Um, so yeah, we got a couple more of his stories. Uh, after one of the delivery the, the, the paper girl <laughs> asks because he offers them a, a vacation who uh, whoever delivers the most papers gets a free trip to uh i forget it's the famous wine region in california the little girl says can i bring my sister and he says what do you think money grows on trees and uh, then we get this trout incidentally had written a book about a money tree it had $20 bills for leaves. Its flowers were government bonds. Its fruit was diamonds. It attracted human beings who killed each other around the roots and made very good fertilizer. So it goes. Uh, cute. We also get the gutless wonder. And again, he's yelling at one of the kids and he calls the kid a gutless wonder. Gutless would be, you know, cowardly. Um, the Gutless Wonder was about a robot who had bad breath. <laughs> he became popular after his halitosis was cured. Halitosis is bad breath. Uh, what made the story remarkable, since it was written in 1932, was that it predicted the widespread use of burning jellied gasoline on human beings. So this is uh, certainly a reference to napalm. Uh, this is important because... Uh, as we mentioned before, this, <clears throat> this book has to be understood in context of, uh, oh, I'm hearing some chats here. Oh, hey, it's lovely. Okay. <laughs> I see you in the chat. 
Um, yeah, napalm was used in Vietnam uh, very famously. Uh, you know, uh, actually, no, he does mention uh, that Billy's son is a Green Beret also in Vietnam. So, I mean, he's clearly referencing Vietnam here. Yes, napalm should absolutely be banned. I think it is banned, but <laughs> unfortunately, bans don't seem to work. <laughs> I think it should be banned. I think it is banned, but I, I don't know if I, you know, there are actually worse weapons at this point that get used. <laughs> Uh, napalm is quaint by comparison. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's a, a, a reference to napalm for sure. It was dropped on them from airplanes. Robots did the dropping. They had no conscience and no circuits, which would allow them to imagine what was happening to the people on the ground. Um, so our robot in the story looked like a human being, could talk and dance and go out with girls. <laughs> Nobody held it against him. He dropped jellied gasoline on people, but they found his bad breath unforgivable. <laughs> That's the thing they don't like about him. But when he cleared that up, he was welcome to the human race. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. The thing that they cannot stand about him is his bad breath. Um, anybody have any comments on that? It's... I know I actually used a graphic of Dresden being bombed uh, instead of what was probably, I should have found a Vietnam one. <clears throat> so he introduces himself, Billy introduces himself to Kilgore. Are you Kilgore? Yes. Trout supposed that Billy had come to complain, had some complaint uh, about the way his newspapers were being delivered. He didn't think of himself as a writer. <laughs> so even Kilgore doesn't have a high opinion of himself for the simple reason that the world had never allowed him to think of himself in that way. The writer, said Billy, the what? Billy was certain he had made a mistake. There's a writer named Kilgore Trout. There is? <laughs> even he's, <laughs> that, that, that question's funny because all Billy said was that, that, that Kilgore Trout exists <laughs> and Kilgore's response is basically, do I, <laughs> do I exist? There is a writer named Kilgore Trout. He looked foolish and dazed. After 75 books. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I love that he, Val Kilgore, <laughs> like Val Kilmer. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, after 75 books, he's still not a writer and doesn't recognize himself as a person who exists. Uh, is it humility? No, it's more like just the world never let him think it. it that this way that it was put, the world never allowed him to think of himself that way. That's that's telling. <laughs> he may have wanted to think of himself that way at some point, but no, the world wouldn't have it. <laughs> you never heard of him? Uh, Trout shook his head. No, nope, nobody ever did. <laughs> Nobody's ever heard of him. Uh, Billy invites... Kilgore to his 18th anniversary party in a pretty funny scene. Uh, Kilgore trolls the party goers. Uh, there's something I wanted to include. I didn't have time. Uh, Kilgore is a person who makes things up on the fly. Do you guys know what that phrase means? He makes things up as he goes along. He's talking and just making things up. Uh, it's called bullshitting. <laughs> okay. The thing I wanted to include, but I didn't have time to, maybe we'll do it in the final session. Uh, there's a relatively famous philosophical tract called On Bullshitting. Yes, it's, it sounds like a joke, um, but it's a, a kind of examination of what that term really means because it's not the same thing as lying. A liar knows the truth and intentionally hides it. Um, it's not pretending in order to fool someone. Uh, and the writer of that piece uh, makes lots of dis linguistic distinctions between things like, uh, you know, improvising, uh, lying, deceiving. Uh, there's a difference between malarkey and bullshit. There's a difference between 
balderdash and bullshit. Um, it's it's pretty good actually because he comes to a, a kind of conclusion that it fits in kind of with what Kilgore is doing. Bullshitting is basically just talking to keep things going and there's an element of wanting to be an entertainer in it it's not the same thing as lying in that sense also and that's something about Kilgore he's just BSing that's what he's doing uh, he tells the woman the beautiful wife of one of the party goers about a story that he wrote that was a famous chef's funeral and all of the other chefs from all over the world came to the funeral and they threw it that they threw spices into the coffin <laughs> before he was buried and they closed the coffin and 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 buried him and and the lady says of course it happened or he says <clears throat> of course that happened because she's like Did that really happened of course it happened if I wrote something that hadn't really happened and tried to sell it, I could go to jail. That's fraud. <laughs> Nagy believed him. I had never thought about that before. Think about it now, he says. <laughs> I love it. He's a funny guy for a curmudgeonly grumpy old man. Uh, it's like advertising. You have to tell the truth in advertising or you'll get in trouble. <laughs> it's Maggie's response. Um, there's the barbershop quartet again. These are the same ones who die earlier in the book in the plane crash. There are the Febs. I think uh, that stands for the four eyed, the four eyed bastards. <laughs> Was it four eyed bastards? <laughs> it's something like that. The Febs. This is the barbershop quartet. Uh, they sing while people drank and Billy and Valencia put their arms around each other. Everybody's eyes were shining. The song was That Old Gang of Mine. I started to play it at the beginning of today's session. Uh, you can find it on YouTube if you're curious. It's an actual song, and it's done in that barbershop quartet style. Um, oh, yeah, some of you weren't here at the beginning. If you can't recognize from the outfits, a barbershop quartet looks like that, and it's basically a four-part harmony maybe sometimes five-part or even three-part harmony. Uh, all, you know, a cappella. It's not, no, no instruments or anything. Uh, gee, that song went, but I'd give the world to see that old gang of mine, and so on. A little later, it said, so long forever, old fellows and gals, so long forever, old sweethearts and pals, God bless them, and so on. Uh, we get the uh, idea in the coming lines that he doesn't have an old gang. There's nothing specific in the lyrics to upset him, but he starts to have a kind of breakdown uh, at that point. Uh, and it's, uh, he, sorry, just a second. Yeah, he has kind of a, he has kind of a nervous breakdown because of the song says, unexpectedly, he found himself upset by the song and the occasion. He had never had an old gang, old sweethearts and pals, but he missed one anyway. As the quartet made slow, agonized experiments with the chords. Yes, there is a baby in the room trying to speak. <laughs> she's a little rascally. Uh, she's still getting used to speaking. <laughs> um, she's really good at making banshee sounds. It's pretty amazing. Uh, anyway, sour, still unbearably sour, and then a chord that was suffocatingly. No, no, <laughs> I'm joking. She's great. Slava Lube. It's a. There's no sorry. She's awesome. I, I love her to death. Uh, it's it's just it's wild. Uh, if you guys aren't following, I, I'm a recent new dad. You know, like for nine months, ten months coming up, and uh, my little girl, she <laughs> is able to make these sounds that do not sound human. <laughs> <laughs> she loves it. It's hilarious. She has this big smile on her face, but I mean, it's got to be, I don't know, I, the, the register that she's singing in, but it literally, I think she could shatter glass if it were just slightly louder. Um, <laughs> and she loves the look on our face that she gets from it, so she always does it. It's pretty funny. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
So yes, uh, Billy had powerful psychosomatic responses to the changing chords. Uh, his mouth filled with the taste of lemonade. His face became grotesque as though he were being stretched on the torture engine called the rack. Uh, that's a little bit of a callback to uh, Roland Weary because Roland Weary, uh, if you guys recall, is the bullyish. Uh, thank you, Christina, also. Yeah, it's been cool. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why everybody says it's so hard to be a dad. It's really easy. <laughs> it's been very cool, actually. <clears throat> the little one is uh, is pretty chill, except when her teeth are hurting her. Uh, okay, so yeah, Billy, uh, this is a, a callback to Roland Weary. So Roland Weary, the bully, who was one of the three musketeers uh, who hates Billy, is really into torture equipment. Do you remember he's always talking about it and his father was into torture stuff? And so this is a little bit of a callback to uh, the Roland Weary, I think, you know. Uh, Kurt likes to tie back to things that he's, you know, previously said. Is it this part when uh, they, uh, he mentioned the uh, Iron Maiden, some kind yeah. of uh, <laughs> torturing uh, yes. equipment? Yeah, the Iron Maiden is basically like a sarcophagus with spikes inside of it. Um, yeah. Uh, Kilgore is, to his credit, immediately concerned with his new friend uh, and is speculating on what has happened because Billy becomes inconsolable. He, he like has to sit down. He's having a nervous attack. Can I make a guess, said Kilgore? You saw through a time window. A what, said Valencia? He suddenly saw the past or future. Am I right? Kilgore knows what's going on. Or if we're going to say that none of this has really happened, uh, this is Kilgore influencing Billy. <laughs> Perhaps something like that. Billy uh, flees upstairs and we get to see uh, for a moment, Billy's son. We've heard of Billy's son. Uh, Billy's son, who would be later become a Green Beret and be shipped off to fight in Vietnam. Um, but here we actually get to see him for a second. Uh, Billy tells Trout to wait downstairs. He goes up. He goes to the bathroom. Uh, he locks the door. And then he realizes there's someone in the bathroom with him, his son. Dad said his son in the dark. Robert, the future Green Beret, was 17 then. Billy liked him, but didn't know him very well. Billy couldn't help suspecting there wasn't much to know about Robert. What do we think about that? Uh, there's not much to know about him. <laughs> Billy flicked on the light. Robert was sitting on the toilet with his pajama bottoms around his ankles. He was wearing an electric guitar slung around his neck on a strap. He had just bought the guitar that day. He couldn't play it yet, and in fact, never learned to play it. It was nacreous pink. Nacreous, that's like, uh, it's like pearl, like biser. <laughs> Could you say biserski? <laughs> uh, that's pretty much, it's like pearl pink, pink biserski. pearl. What is it? Uh, biserski. biserski? Bisersky, okay. Yeah. yeah, it's like pearlescent pink. Uh, sounds like Polish. It does. It sounds Polish for sure. <laughs> uh, hello, son, said Billy Pilgrim. And he said, Billy responds, hello, dad, but I didn't put that. Uh, hello, son, hello, dad. Uh, that's... I'm trying to think how real that is. <laughs> It's a very overly formal way of referring to each other if you're father and son. Um, I mean, it's not overly formal to the point of him saying sir or something like that, but it's not formal. It's distant. Do, do you understand? It's, uh, it's not like, hey, kid, what are you doing? Hey, come on over here. What, let's take a look at that guitar. <laughs> no, it's hello, son. Hello, dad. Yeah, what kind of relationship is that? You're a father too, Slavoljub. Great. How old is yours? Is it son or a daughter? Uh, 
uh, a son. I have a son, uh, 15 years old, uh, eighth okay. grader. Nice, nice. Yeah, I can't even think about that <laughs> right now. <laughs> One day at a time. <laughs> I can't even think about my little one getting to be 15. I, like, I'm worried about when she's going to start walking. <laughs> That's enough to worry about for now. She's already getting close. Um, <laughs> so how would you describe this relationship? I guess I kind of just described it there. Um, how would you describe this relationship between Billy and his son? I mean, how close can Billy get to people step by step? Exactly. That's what I'm worried about. <laughs> step by step. Uh, how, how close can Billy get to anyone? <laughs> That's kind of a, a, a maybe a prior question, logically prior question to this one. Um, because as we keep saying, Billy is just, you know, kind of a passive uh, recipient of his life experiences in some pretty important ways. So distant, yeah, they have a distant, distant relationship, even though they live in the same house. Uh, <clears throat> Billy heads to his bedroom and remembers the past. So notice the way that this is phrased. Billy had th uh, thought about the effect the quartet had had on him and found an association with an experience he had long had had long ago. He did not travel in time to the experience. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, we're told that very specifically. They, we should know that this is not a time jump, right? He remembered it shimmeringly as follows. Who remembers why he freaks out about the, the barbershop quartet? Anyone? before I go forward. I'm just testing your memory now. <laughs> because, well, let's find out. Uh, he was down in the meat locker the night that Dresden was destroyed. There were sounds like giant footsteps above. Those were sticks of high explosive bombs. Uh, the giants walked and walked. The meat locker was a very safe shelter. shelter. All that happened down there was an occasional shower of calcimine. That's like uh, whitewash. You know, you put it on the, the wall to make it white. Uh, the American and four of their guards, Americans and four of their guards, and a few dressed carcasses were down there and nobody else. The rest of the guards had, before the raid began, gone to, comfort, gone to the comforts of their own homes in Dresden. They were being killed with their families. So it goes. So ironically, the prisoners in the slaughterhouse are the safe ones. Uh, the guards drew together instinctively, rolled their eyes. They experimented with one expression and then another, said nothing, though their mouths were often open. They looked like a silent film of a barbershop quartet. So that's the thing. It's interestingly put, you know, he sees the barbershop quartet and sees the guards with their mouths open. Um, uh -huh. uh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Slavolub. As I've uh, often said, and for those of you just joining, Yelena, uh, we put this together in such a way that even if you haven't done the reading, I know you've read it already, but even if somebody hasn't done the reading, we still try to make it so that they get the story. That way they can still attend. And that's why some of the slides here are or many of the slides are just to keep the story going for continuity for people who haven't read. Um, also because it's fun. <laughs> so yes, he makes the connection between the barbershop quartet and uh, the guards with their mouths hanging open and closed and open and closed. Silent and silent, yeah. Like a silent film of a barbershop quartet. It's a good image. I mean, you know, not good, like, like yay, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's powerful. It's uh, impactful. So long forever, they might've been singing, old fellows and pals, so long forever, old sweethearts and pals, God bless them. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, those are the lyrics to the song. Okay, I guess you guys know that. I don't, don't need to say it. <laughs> Billy then finds himself uh, back on the spaceship. Montana Wild Hack, the film star, says, tell me a story, Billy. She says, Billy boy, in the line before that. Uh, she says to Billy, in the zoo, they were in bed side by side. They had privacy. The canopy covered the dome. Montana was six months pregnant now, big and rosy, lazily demanding small favors from Billy from time to time. She couldn't send Billy out for ice cream or strawberries since the atmosphere, atmosphere outside the dome was cyanide and the nearest strawberries and ice cream were millions of light years away. Um, so I think this is, yeah, where we first find out that she's pregnant. So he's living, you know, this other life. Uh, his Trafalmador life, his Trafalmadorian life, we could say perhaps that's his life, his coping life. That's the life where he is comfortable for the only time in his existence. And it's also very possibly not real at all. <laughs> it's uh, perhaps just totally constructed experience. Um, we've talked about this before, but you know, for, for those of you who weren't here for that discussion, um, you'll notice that his Trophamador experience is very much like a kind of adolescent, you know, immature fantasy. <laughs> like I'm on this sh spaceship with the beautiful movie star and we, we're, we live together. We have to live together. There's no choice, you know, <laughs> and we have to sleep together. There's no choice. <laughs> and uh, you know, we're kept alive. <laughs> he gets applause for taking a pee. You know, it's like his life is so easy. He's finally, he finally feels good about himself. Um, anyway, not to backtrack. He tells her, Dresden was destroyed on the night of February 13th, 1945. We came out of our shelter the next day. He told Montana about the four guards who in their astonishment and grief resembled a barbershop quartet. He told her about the stockyards with all the fence posts gone, with roofs and windows gone. Told her about seeing little logs lying around. There were people who had been caught in the firestorm. So it goes. Uh, Billy told her what had happened to the buildings <clears throat> that used to form cliffs around the stockyards. So basically, they used to be enclosed in their little slaughterhouse. They used to have a kind of enclosure surrounded by buildings. And that's why he says, they used to form cliffs around the stockyards. They had collapsed. Their wood had been consumed and their stones had crashed down, had tumbled against one another until they locked at last in low and graceful curves. Um, I don't know if I included the part about them. They realized that in order to survive, they have to crawl over those, those curves and it's like the moon. Now, if we're taking the position that none of this is real, I mean, this part, yes, the, the bombing, yes, that's real, but uh, it could be significant that he says it was like the moon. Uh, if you imagine somebody experiencing an extreme trauma like that, and then looking around and seeing an alien landscape, uh, that could contribute, right? to his later ideations about aliens and you know coping it might have occurred to him at that moment it may be the case that the story occurred to kurt vonnegut <laughs> looking around in in reality you know at, after the firebombing and saying this is like another planet <clears throat> you know when i was when i was little I lived, yes, like Twin Peaks. <laughs> um, when I was little, I lived for a few years in Iceland, uh, in Keflavik, Iceland. And that's an impression that you frequently get if you live in Iceland, if you go out away from the city, it's like being on another planet. It's like, it's not finished yet. You know, <laughs> it's like the planet's not finished being made. <laughs> and I had those kinds of ideas looking around, 
you know, I could pretend to myself as a little kid that when I got on the plane to get to Iceland, that I really got on a spaceship. And that's how I wound up in this strange alien landscape. <laughs> um, so yeah, this could be, this could contribute to Billy's alien ideas, or it could even have contributed to Kurt Vonnegut's story idea, you know? He could have said, wow, this is like an alien place. <clears throat> Yeah, it was cool. Uh, <clears throat> it's in fact cold. <laughs> no, um, Iceland is, uh, it's great. It's, you know, the whole time we were there, not the whole time, a lot of time you complain about it while you live there because it's, you know, it's freezing cold and <clears throat> the water smells like sulfur. Um, even the water that comes from the tap smells like sulfur. You get used to that. <laughs> it's probably better now. <clears throat> um, but when you leave Iceland, you definitely miss it because it's there's nothing quite like that place. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Billy's story ended. Pardon me, I need to take a sip of this. Oh, yes. <clears throat> definitely saw the Northern Lights pretty frequently. In fact, as a little kid, uh, by the... I don't know if you guys see the chat. I'm responding to chat sometimes. I'm not schizophrenic. <laughs> um, yes, saw the uh, Aurora Borealis for sure. I used to freak myself out. When I was that age, I loved uh, ghost stories and especially folk ghost stories. And I was reading Icelandic folk ghost stories, which are extremely freaky. The freakiest uh, ghost stories for me at that age, and probably still, were Japanese ones and Icelandic ones. <clears throat> because, for example, in Iceland, they have the vengeful ghosts of, <clears throat> of babies who had to be left in the cold because the family couldn't feed them. That's a terrifying concept, <laughs> and that the ghost of the child would come into the, you know, like hut. These are old stories. This is like, you know, not modern Icelandic <laughs> stories. Um, these are like Vikings tales, right? The ghost of the child would come into the, the hut and burrow its fists into your eyes. And I was like, geez, that's hardcore. Uh, so anyway, the reason I'm bringing this up is I would freak myself out with all these scary like Icelandic folk ghost stories and then walk home under the Northern Lights and look at the Northern Lights and just like freak myself out seeing things like, oh my God, it looks like a giant <laughs> demon or something. And uh, that was fun. I loved to terrify myself growing up. It was one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> I was always really into like scary movies and stuff. I mean, you know, who doesn't, at least to some extent, like as a kid, getting together with your friends to tell scary stories? It's fun. You know, I just, I, I wound up spending a lot of time alone. I had a few friends in Iceland, but uh, I didn't speak Icelandic. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's a cool place. Anyway, back to the story. Well, pretty much the end of this chapter here. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Billy's story ended curiously uh, in a suburb that had completely escaped the bombing. So they go outside of the city. The guards and the Americans came at nightfall to an inn. That's like a little you know, hotel, if you haven't heard that before, <clears throat> which was open for business. There was candlelight. There were fires in three fireplaces downstairs. There were empty tables and chairs and empty beds. Uh, with covers turned down upstairs. So the innkeeper and his wife are dutifully waiting for somebody to show up, <clears throat> even though they've seen the city burned. Uh, yeah, the innkeeper, his wife, and their two young daughters who worked as waitresses, they knew that Dresden, Dresden was gone. Uh, those with eyes had seen it burn and burn, understood that they were on the edge of a desert now. Still, they had opened for business had polished the glasses and wound the clocks and stirred the fires and waited and waited to see who would come and who should arrive but all of the American prisoners and four guards. 
um, <clears throat> at the end of the chapter, uh, the innkeeper says the Americans can sleep in the stable. He gives them soup and ersatz coffee. Ersatz means replacement or something that should stand in the place of. It's a German word. It, uh, it is used in English. Uh, we do. Uh, it's not commonly used, but it is an English word also. Basically, it's something like it's it's coffee, but misspelled slightly, <laughs> uh, and a little beer. He came out to the stable to listen to them bedding down on the straw. Good night, Americans. He said in German, "Sleep well." So that's uh, also interesting. Uh, Kurt wants to pretty frequently wants to impress upon us how many people are not, <laughs> they're not into the war, right? Um, and you could imagine some Germans living in the suburbs of Dresden at the end of World War II are probably entirely sick of the war. They don't want it anymore. <laughs> um, so they probably don't have, you know, extremely of course, they have bad feelings about Americans, you know, being there. But on the other hand, they could probably understand. <laughs> They're all aware of who Hitler is, <laughs> um, so they could probably understand why the Americans and the and the Brits and the Russians are are there. Um, so he, yeah, uh, almost uh, let's let's say endearingly <laughs> wishes them a good night as they go to sleep, and he doesn't do it for show. He says it in German, right? That that tells us that he's not doing it as a, a show. Okay, well, that's it for those two chapters. Those were really short chapters. Uh, I think, uh, I can't remember the length of the last two. Yes, our next session is the second to the last session because the next session is the end of the book. The next session is chapters nine and 10, but we have the final, oh, you think Hitler's in South America? Could be, could be, Argentina, yeah. Ah, he's in the hollow earth. <laughs> That's what I heard. His, his brain is alive in a jar somewhere. <laughs> um, next week is uh, the last two chapters. But as I said, uh, we have a, a session at the very end where we just talk about related topics uh, I guess we'll start calling that the mopping up session. Um, we're probably going to talk about free will because that was a suggested topic that fits in with what's happening in this story. Uh, the question of free will is, I think, a pretty good one. A lot of people can weigh in. Um, I'm trying to think of some other topics. Mental health, for sure. Uh, any other things, really, it's kind of an open forum in that last session. Uh, as long as we're kind of staying on topic, you know, let's not go, let's not swim too far from the shore. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's for digressions. Ooh, and you know what else? I wish Nicola was here because he suggested uh, letting you guys have some. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was like an art collector. Yeah, yeah. Um, listen, I was thinking about letting you guys uh, have some influence on the next group's book, but it's not going to be a free-for-all. I'm going to make a list of books, and we're going to let people vote. Um, uh, the, keep in mind that you can submit a suggestion, but the, the uh, there are some restrictions. Um, the book length should be probably you know we're doing short books because we're not we're not doing very long uh reading groups you know so we're picking stuff that's generally under 300 pages preferably under 250 pages um and we are definitely uh steering towards work that has some philosophical content of some type <laughs> uh it doesn't have to be a philosophy book. I mean, this is not a philosophy book, but you know what I mean. We can get uh, we can get quality discussions about things out of the story, as opposed to being just like a spy. 
like a spy novel would be an example of what we don't want to do. Uh, or, you know, it's like a typical, you know, adventure or mystery novel. No, nothing like that. We're doing stuff that has uh, some profundity to it, right? Uh, some depth, okay? That's what we want. Um, yeah, I'm still compiling a list I've just started. And uh, what we're hoping <clears throat> is to grow this group, you know, so that we have regular attendees because we're going to keep doing it, okay? And we're going to keep posting it on YouTube. Maybe we'll get uh, a decent following going. That's the goal. I don't know. It would be nice, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, hmm. Uh, but I didn't uh, know the fact that you're posting our uh, sessions on YouTube uh, and I didn't have time to re revisit it or to review it. Well, you I send you guys the link every week. Yes, of course, you <laughs> send it. Uh, but uh, I didn't know because of my professional reasons, mm -hmm. I intended to... Uh, to post on YouTube my personal uh, teachings. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know uh, if uh, this, um, uh, I didn't uh, watch uh, your uh, uh -huh. re recording. Okay. And uh, maybe it would be confronted uh, with uh, my personal, professional life. Uh, not personal. Uh -huh. So you're saying you do not consent to having your uh, your video on YouTube? Is that it? Uh, no, no, no. Just go ahead. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, at um, uh, sometimes uh, mm -hmm. it occurs to me that uh, it uh, might be involved. Oh, I think uh, someone is smashing the papers and uh, yeah, somebody starting tearing apart. The okay. Papers. Uh, yeah, I, th the I think the noise it's... just stopped. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So go ahead. You were uh, saying about the clear and uh, loud. Uh, I think uh, I don't know. I didn't uh, uh, have experience uh, with uh, the uh, the sound. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's fixed. I need uh, uh, I need uh, to record myself to record my voice uh, in uh, professional uh, manners, in professional manner speaking, uh, because uh, I'm supposed to live uh, uh, on the base of English language and literature in which I'm a kind of professional. I don't know. I see. Like, professor of English language and uh, literature. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and yeah, well, uh, I mean, okay, that's cool. You can post uh, anything uh, you like or uh, record it. Uh, you have my permission now. Okay, I, if somebody has any issue. I don't, I don't think uh, it uh, would uh, um, endanger my career in future <laughs> but uh, sometimes it occurs on my mind you know i see uh, like uh, uh, some kind of uh, paranoid uh, hey brother you're, you're talking to me I... <laughs> in my mind i don't know i believe in my mind which is vast mm -hmm. Uh, I believe in myself. I believe in freedom. I believe in you all. Know, I don't know. Okay. Well, look. Uh, it's I not don't a problem. believe in amateurs that are doing the job and selling to Chinese or Japanese mm -hmm. students. Uh, students uh, of English language and literature. Mm -hmm. And they're selling their stories, uh, bedtime stories about how to go to America or I don't know, Europe, because all of them want to go there. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, they want uh, for uh, their children the best. And uh, the price of, uh, of the price of uh, 
professional English, uh, like, let's say, like English uh, proficiency, that is C1, C2 mm -hmm. level, is about uh, $15 to $30, just 20, 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's wild. <laughs> uh, that's uh, really wild. Yeah. And uh, I'm in uh, this... Um, states uh, state of mind uh, when i'm uh, totally liberal to sell to speak i don't know whatever i want to do to mm -hmm. say uh, whatever <clears throat> okay well listen uh just you know keep your eye on there I, it's not a problem for us to take out bits uh or you know take out audio uh i i can edit the film i'm relatively good at that now um, so yeah, if you guys have any issues about that, just, just let me know, but, uh, yeah, officially for next week, we're doing chapters nine and 10. And again, if you guys didn't know, or weren't here before you can, if you want a specific part of the book to be discussed, you can email me and I'll put it in one of the slides so that we can talk about it. It's totally open like that. Uh, so feel free, should you desire to talk about some specific thing in the book, to let me know and I'll put it in the presentation. <clears throat> so yeah, that's, that's it for now. Um, I hope you guys had a good time. Okay, uh, it's fine for me. Uh, just uh, I want to, to work on my uh, fluency in English as my British fellow friends from the church, uh, St. Mary's Church, Belgrade, mm -hmm. uh, used to say, uh, just practice on your fluency and all the things uh, will be right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you wanted to say something, Nevena? Uh, yes, uh, um, to say um, uh, I meant uh, your, this, your uh, audio is not working. between um, how to say, uh, uh, no, never mind. Uh, unfortunately, your, your audio is not coming through very well. It's very broken. Um, so I can hardly hear what you're saying. Okay, guys, I've got to, <laughs> I've got to, I've got to run back to my, my little girl here and uh, make sure she has something to eat. But I hope to see you all again next week. Yes. All right. Take bye. care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Here I am. Evo Evo Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.